city, is it? Somewhere in Ontario. And uh, the first memory which I had of her was that her mother had her on her back, and she was just one year old or something, and then it rained, and she had a lung infection, and it snowed. And then her husband and she had a long discussion. I had a wonderful guest house, like we have it here on campus, an old one. And so I wanted to bring them in, but they had a discourse about coming in or not while they were getting wet all the time. So finally we rescued her, both of them, all of them. So not uh, told her the story of the past. They got divorced later on, Maria. <coughs> and so she, um, that's a whole mess in itself. But as far as critical theory is concerned, my student was Tim Reimer, Professor Reimer, and I visited him too. And um, he... Uh, about a dissertation with me on a Tillich and um, a fascist, Hirsch was his name. And I never thought that it would be possible. You know, Tillich was very close to the critical theory. As a matter of fact, Adorno was his student and he uh, wrote his dissertation on Kierkegaard, the second dissertation, habilitation, with Tillich. And Tillich also was responsible that Horkheimer could become a full professor and then could become the director of the institute. So without Tillich, this whole thing would not have worked. I bought my wife his book, The New hmm? Being. Hmm? I bought my wife his book, The New Being. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So many yeah. times I saw it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, this is what really... Tillich was an extraordinary type of guy, but what I didn't uh, get, you know, how one could get Hirsch and Tillich together in one book. And so he has written another one, and he gave it to me from 2005, on Tillich. So I said, do you have Hirsch in there? Just a little bit. Then I looked at these five chapters of Hirsch again. And this is something very strong, this fighting in him, in Jim, between that socialist Tillich, because he wrote the socialist decision, um, which he could not show here, by the way, and he wrote the boundary instead, because otherwise everybody would have hated him and he would have to go home to the Nazis again. In spite of the fact that this was the best book, according to him, which he wrote in the Engadin in the Seeds Marie, where Nietzsche had written the, and thus spoke Zarathustra. So it came out in 1933, and the culture minister, fascist culture minister, asked it to rescind it and take it out of the bookstores. If he would do that, he would get the best uh, uh, chair in, in Germany. And he left in his face and left with Horkheimer and his wife in, in fall 1933. So that was it. And then, you know, I was afraid always he would starve to death because of the horrible fate um, of, of American professors. They divided their, in, in Union Seminary, <coughs> they divided their salary so they could pay his salary. And, and Niebuhr had brought him over and helped him to go. So now there's this tension, and it is there up to the present. <laughs> and it is grounded in real sociological data because uh, as we were in the Serbian fellows' home, um, we talked about the end of capitalism, now federalization and uh, nationalization and so on. And suddenly Jim came up and said, and what will happen to the farmers, you know? And what will happen to the tradesmen? Ah, oh, what will happen with Joe the plumber? That is the crisis. <laughs> And then he suddenly defended unbelievably, you know, the, uh, the small farmers and, and so on. And the, the uh, Marinko still has communistic background, is it all of what is always communism and so on. But um, uh, since Jim is rooted in the low middle class, really, uh, he's just a small college, you know, and uh, doesn't make too much money, he just did a dissertation, he uh, made a doctor exam, gave a doctor exam in Toronto, he just came back when we. When we met him, he always wanted to be Professor Toronto, but he always stayed in Conrad Grable, which is the sadness of his life. But we, we wrote a fest script for him, so I have an article in it too, and, and his daughter is now, um, she wrote about Reimer, Jung, and Freud. <laughs> so she really loves her father, so nevertheless, she has now gone into the Freudian studies, which is, is good, which is a moment of hope. So, um, no less, the, um, you know, so I said well, one can hopefully rescue, uh, you know, the low middle class uh, or have a private sector uh, where, farm, you know, Mennonite farmers and so on can 
But uh, Marie Curie made clear to him that the low middle class is the real source for fascism, you know. And it's also medieval. So when we told him, hi, when, when we told him about that this is medieval, he got already shocked. When we said it was low, middle class people got shocked. So, uh, but they are threatened by the labor unions from below, and they are oppressed by the uh, chains and by the high, the high bourgeoisie. So he asked, what is beyond the, the low bourgeoisie? You know, he didn't think there was anything. That there was a middle bourgeoisie, you know, like Kalamazoo, we don't have any upper class, we only have a middle bourgeoisie. But then what is the upper bourgeoisie, and, and so on and so on, so it was not entirely clear. But, you know, sociologically and psychologically, he was completely rooted in, in this low middle class. And that Hirsch, you know, he cannot let go Hirsch as little as he can let go the low middle class to which he belongs, and he was not entirely aware, you know, why he always has this damn fish, and why he cannot go, you know, uh, to the... And the other things, you know, Hirsch was a very chaste man. I mean, he was so ugly that he had to be chaste, you know. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, Tillich looked very good, and he was a womanizer. Every book he wrote, there was a woman for every book which he wrote, he had a woman. And he wrote a lot of books, you know. <laughs> By the way, Nancy Ford prides herself that she almost became the object of his erotic feelings. She was sitting <laughs> in a bathing suit on a rock on Lake Michigan here and Tilly's marched by, you know, to have his health march or whatever. And she always thinks that she somehow, he somehow looked somewhat lustfully at her, which I have serious doubts about it. That is the great oh, oh. happiness of her life, so I do not want to deprive her of this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Almost a lover of poetry. <coughs> but it went wrong once, you know, with Tilly. I mean, it went wrong, really. Every time it went wrong, but <laughs> once it really went wrong. And that was when he uh, had a Jewish woman in order to write a book. And, and uh, then she died from cancer. And he went to the funeral and wanted to, you know, say something or whatever. And there was all of May and all these Jewish uh, eggs and, you know, all the Jewish psychoanalysts were there. And there was a horribly cold atmosphere, you know. They all rejected him and he couldn't say anything whatsoever. But I think he himself, you know, suffered from the demon and uh, couldn't free himself from his demon. I mean, when he married the second time, and he, he, instead of going to the apartment of his new wife, he went to the apartment of another wife in the wedding night. But the, the war, you know, the First World War and the Second World War and all this uh, destroyed, in a certain sense, this bourgeois type of a thing. So his wife had an illegitimate child at home while he was an army chaplain at the front. And he had a, a, a child from an illegitimate child, so and they got divorced. And, and Hannah, the second wife, she was open for this, you know. So when Connie Lowe went to her once and said, he has another one, I can't bear it, I, I have to go. He didn't want to be, he was such a Puritan, Presbyterian guy, Connie Lowe. And so Hannah said, you know, Paulus, Paulus needs this, so you have to stay in the state. She wrote a book after his death where all the women are uh, mentioned whom we had in his life. Yeah. So she was tolerant enough and the marriage lasted until he died in Chicago uh, the night after he had his students who all had turned into God is dead students. That was the only specifically American theological movement ever, the God is dead movement. Maynard Kaufman belonged to it here. And so, after they left, he got his heart attack. That was his end. But somebody must have paid him in the end, because he, he had a nice uh, pension. Somebody set it up for him, I think. So, that was our, uh, you know, thing. And, and Jim Weimer is a beautiful fellow, and he is a green grass singer, too. But he keeps that a secret. Bluegrass? Bluegrass, yeah, bluegrass. <laughs> <laughs> Bluegrass singer, so he's, it's really a shame though, much, but he does it anyway. And he, it's the tenor in the bluegrass thing, there. so that, that fits also in the low middle class, the bluegrass uh, thing. There. Yeah. Okay, that was the Canadian trip. Now, what we want to do, first of all, I want to give the papers back, which I have uh, corrected, the ones which I have graded. Do we have uh, lights on already? Yeah, I, I've just turned it on, this one here. Yeah.
Then we can also turn this one on for you. Yeah. Is this comfortable for you? Oh, yeah. There is a chair over there. I'm comfy here by the fire. You feel good there? Mm-hmm. Okay, very good. <coughs> okay, we have here with Walter Jensen. You all know Walter Jensen. And Walter Jensen wrote about the new proletariat. Marcuse is one dimensional human being. So the whole paper goes through the um, different notions of. Um, of what proletariat it is now called precariat in Europe precariat that means people who live precariously so nobody wants to be a proletarian anymore but the precariat exists now that's the news and I think I wrote it down somewhere here so um, you know proletariat uh, I mean it's a Latin thing and it means originally people who had a lot of proles that means a lot of children so it was the number of children which put somebody into the proletariat. Um, as far as Marx is concerned, he still has this meaning because he applies the Darwinian uh, ideas to society. And so the people who are at the bottom of the capitalistic society, <coughs> their lives are threatened most. So the life expectancy of a black man in Detroit is 42 years old and of a white man would be 76 years or so. So the more your life is threatened, like in the animal world, the more you procreate. So a little mouse is much more threatened than a cat, therefore a little mouse has four children every month or so. And uh, so therefore this hangs together with the idea of the classless society. If the class society is, uh, is overcome, then this threatened stratum of society will no longer exist and then there will be no proletariat anymore. So the issue of Marx is to deproletarize people. So uh, but then there came his controversy with Malthus. I don't know if you know the Malthusian thing. Malthus was a priest in the Anglican Church and at the same at the time of the controversy he wasn't married yet. <coughs> Later on he married and had four children. But he developed this uh, sociological economic for, uh, uh, formula that the increase of um, human reproduction is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. And the food reproduction is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that means the human reproduction outruns the food production, and therefore there is always starvation. And, uh, and, and wars and so on, which reduce then the numbers of the, of the proletariat. So that was the Malthus's solution was then for people to live a chaste life. Now the proletariat, because of the precarious uh, life situation and because there is little sublimation and sex is the only joy which people have, uh, it was very hard and it did not work, of course, until the capitalists paid $10 million to put the whole working class on the pill. And that happened in the 1960s, shortly before the council. And uh, that worked. They reached zero population. That means everybody that produced it was at once. And that means every family should have two children. And when you look at my family, of course, I did not obey this law of capitalism. And so I had eight children. But and you look at my children now, altogether they have 14 children. And that means that everybody, they all died of my children. So that means seven children, everybody that produced himself twice, as he's, once, as he's supposed to. And now some of them did not get married, but, uh, and some of them made the decision to have three or whatever. But in the end, the number 14 comes out. So there you can see about, you know, economic determinism or whatever. It works exactly like market research or the, um, you know, the way, uh, the, the voting uh, predictions and so on and so on. Because the whole thing runs on rails, the whole thing. You know, when they say, uh, you know, people buy clean toilet paper or whatever, they do market research and they find out what people want and then they put Tchaikovsky music to, to, to it, you know, ta da 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 and then they put all the toilet paper in. And they have a lot of toilet paper, green toilet paper, not like no money anymore, so it's a catastrophe for the mess. But it all goes, it can be predicted because the freedom of choice is phony. And the freedom of choice, according to Marx and the whole Western tradition, would be real only if there would be a freedom of being. 
<coughs> and the freedom of being means that alienation would be overcome because the freedom of being means that one goes out to the other and the other allows us to return to ourselves to be at peace with ourselves to be at home with ourselves that is the idea of freedom and it has two uh, sick forms to it and one is the narcissus and that is the narcissistic society an atomistic, liberal atomistic society so it's very narcissistic and therefore most people do not get to the other really and then there's a the Don Juan guy who does get to the others but he never finds anybody or some mechanism in him prevents him to, find, to come home to himself in order to reach that freedom. So only if this freedom of being uh, could be realized, that means if all forms of alienation could be overcome. And an alienated society is therefore the opposite of a free society. So the more alienation you have among the genders and the races and the classes and so on, the less free a society is. That means in the sense of the freedom of being and the less freedom of choice really exists. Okay, so that was, now the question is, you know, how does that really work? And since nowhere a communist society exists, and since no class of society has been established, Marx would say we have that problem, and the Marxists, you know, in China and so on, then became Malthusians. That means they continued bourgeois Malthusianism by, for instance, in, in, in uh, China, you know, they write you can have one child, but now they have opened up to two children, and so in the factory they write who can have a child and if you have more than one formerly and now more than two it's forced abortion that the state pays for it and so on so they, even when you argue that you would work double or your wife and you could make it economically and so on they will not allow it and the whole neighborhood and the grandmothers and everybody is engaged in preventing that this one more child or so will not happen because they are over one billion. It's amazing that they allowed, you know, the second one so that everybody kept, had produced himself only half before. Now everybody had produced himself once, uh, as it is with us. So Yet the population uh, still grows. Yeah, it still grows. Yeah, this is another complication. But the complication is that as long as you have not really reached a communist society, a class of society, you have always an underclass which is threatened and therefore there is still this tendency to have more children than you can afford. <coughs> and so as long as this is not reached, the socialists remain bourgeois in terms of bourgeois Malthusianism. So the whole thing is quite logical and then we have to see where the mistakes in the logic are, for, uh, you know, because with this Malthusianism, it shouldn't, uh, uh, it should really work, but um, it works now only because of the pill. And the question is, you know, do they have enough pills in Africa or whatever, or is it too expensive? It's a market affair, it's a commodity which, uh, you know, may be too expensive for most people. By the way, in terms of contemporary issue, Obama has signed, has uh, relaxed the stem cell research thing which was phony before anyway because while well, the president limited it, the Republican Party in California had set aside millions and millions of dollars for, for research and the argument will be of course that if it is not done in the States it will be done somewhere else and, and so on and so on. So it has just broken through and to the, uh, as far as the fundamentalists are concerned, Catholics and Protestants, they lost the battle just a day ago or so. Okay, back to this, there is the Lupin proletariat and what that is. So, um, let me add this too. So, it's people who have a lot of children, poor less. But um, for Marx, it is not simply the workers, but only when the workers became, become conscious of their dependency and so on. So, my cleaning women come on Friday and I will have to pay them $120 and they're three women and they get $10 each. Uh, are they really aware, are they conscious that uh, the owner, the owner takes 70, what is it, uh, uh, 30, so they pays $90, and then he has to pay for the gasoline and the use of the car and some other things. Um, 
but is that, uh, you know, are they aware of this? And not only aware of it, but that they want to do something about it. And every time that they come, they're different women usually, um, then I ask them that. And sometimes it goes to the point where somebody says, you know, I'm a grandmother and I would like to introduce a union because I want to leave something for my children, for my grandchildren. It is rather moving, you know. But the next time she doesn't appear anymore, she has been fired. So um, this is, uh, I mean, this is satanic, you know. I, I listened to, um, to a fellow from Princeton, a, a wonderful fellow this morning in the, in the, in the uh, car, and he was an economist for, for health, for the health system. When General Motors fires somebody in Canada or in Germany, although they're originally German, um, then they lose their salary, but they don't lose their health insurance. When General Motors fires somebody in Michigan, he loses his salary and his health insurance, and he said this is satanic. I mean, Princeton is a very Christian place, so <laughs> the category fits. So, uh, the great Satan, you know. The is, German is the today. Yeah. 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 And, but what I want to ask that woman today is, uh, you know, also if, if Islam could make a contribution, you know, to this present economic palaver in which we are, you know, this tsunami and so on, with, with the usury laws and so on, but somehow we couldn't get to this because she was off, you know, somewhere else. I mean, it was so far away from any possibility to ask that question, you know. And I would like to have pushed her, what, what, what do you do now, you know. She was off into the pictures. <laughs> yeah, the pictures, yeah, phenomenological. So, <laughs> so, uh, so the, the, that means uh, um, a proletarian is somebody who is a worker who is aware of his working conditions and the satanic character of his working conditions. That the owner of these three women or this business, you know, lives down in Miami and joins himself. He doesn't even, he doesn't even do the administration of the whole thing or collecting the money or whatever. They do everything. He does nothing. And the one who does nothing gets these 90 or 80 or whatever, 70 dollars. And these people there get just enough, maybe not even enough, to restore the energy which they have to spend next day so they can sleep. And by the way, health insurance would be necessary because if they get sick, they cannot come back to work. So uh, what the salary for, uh, is, or what, what even the slaveholder has to give to the slaves, he had to give them a clothing, he had to give them housing, and he had to give them health care because if they got sick and died, he lost his capital, so therefore he did this, you know. And, by the way, when he had no work in winter, he would not fire him, you know, because it would be too expensive to buy a new slave. So he kept him and fed him while he was not working, and so on. So, I mean, these are real satanic. But when you become aware of the satanic situation in which 180 million people live in this country, then you become a politician. But this concept is not, is not used in any way, I think. Right? Yeah, but you're using it as a philosophical description right. instead of a sociological one. Right, yeah. It is true. Because whether, you know, if the patient doesn't believe they have cancer, and they have cancer, right. and they have cancer, if the proletariat does not believe that it is, has to sell its labor in order to live, it's still a proletariat. Yeah. So your well, worker doesn't actually, they all know that. They just have no idea what to do to get yeah. it. Every single person knows, and, and they'll take a real right-wing attitude. You've got to work in order to live. They'll tell you well, that. Of right-wingers will tell you that every day. The thing is, they have no clue how the cloud of organize is, is gone. Right. right. But, you know, you the delusions. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. But they're still, pro they're still proletarian. Well, that, that's the question now, you know. So, in, in Marxian terms, he would only become a politician. But, you know, when you really study the consciousness of these cleaning women, some of them are not aware of this at all. They think it's completely normal, there's nothing wrong with this. His mother did it, his grandmother did it, and the joy that one has a job at all, you know, in that time. So one is grateful to the employer that he gives you a, a job at all, you know. But the price for having a job at all is that you have to indulge in being exploited and so 
now that there are stages of awareness, you know, some of these women have this awareness and some of them don't have it. So in some cases, the middle range, you know, where people really are aware of this and say we should do something about it, what can we do? And then somebody does something about it, namely, I want to uh, start a union, you know, among, and then of course all the others are frightened. Uh, well, what will happen and then they show them all what will happen by firing her and then they are frightened and are grateful and so on and so on. this is satanic you know but also to, to be aware of this satanic business you know uh, that would be the real proletarian consciousness so this doctor this, this uh, economist from Princeton there he said, I do not participate in the American experience because I have a wonderful health insurance. And he made a difference between professor in Ivy League colleges and professor in other colleges. So he said, I have an enormous salary and I have an enormous health insurance, you know. And so I do not... all the bills for him. Huh? Yeah, right. all yeah, the bills because all he's, he has no time for this whole stuff, you know. So um, she looks in the health insurance, so she just does all these little things, you know. But I mean that he was honest enough, you know, to say, I'm not participating in the American experience. And, and a real, we, we don't need, I mean, I don't need that, and, and my colleagues don't need that, you know. So, um, so not everybody participates in this, but if somebody participates in this experience, is aware of it, and wants not only has a theory about it, but has also engages in practical action, he is a proletarian. So the, the, the element of revolution, for instance, may be, uh, may be intrinsic to it. And revolution can take the form of progressive taxation, by the way, according to Engels at least. So if these people, you know, these cleaning women would, for instance, say, you know, how can we change this? Or Libyans, or another one would say, you know, if they would pro uh, progressively tax that guy who exploits us. Because through uh, taking the taxes away from these 90 dollars or whatever he has, that could flow back into education and to health insurance and, and all this. And so, so that was a fantastic. You had him. Oh, yeah. What was his name? What was his name? Can't remember anymore. But it was Austin. today or yeah, today. 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 It was NPR. NPR. Yeah, he was Princeton yeah, right, right. and he's. What political yeah. economist of health yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, he was really very honest. Yeah, yeah very clear on the website. Also, yeah. that it has to be yeah. done now. Oh yeah, the now or never. See, you yeah. know, and he said, you know, because uh, because of that president and that Congress and so, on. but there is more to it, you know, because and if he you go said the national health care only yeah. way, no, yeah, right. no half million. Yeah. Out. But he talked about class and that we are class society and that it will be very unlikely and that Obama had not promised 100 percent, which is a weakening of the position. It must be made 100 percent and now because of the division of the, of the federalization, either going the fascist way or going the socialistic way. That is really what is behind this. Not only this Congress now or this president, in this kind of next four, eight years, this has to be decided which way we go. And if we go the fascist way, it will remain very much like this. They will let these cleaning women work without health insurance and all this, you know. And so he was honest, you know, but he was still a little bit hiding things, you know, which he was very much aware of. Yeah, but he knew to whom he was talking, and he wants to be called back again. So. Yeah, there's another control, you know, and when you go on television, what you can say, what not, and when you say a certain word, you will never be invited again. Okay, so that, the other thing is now what you brought in, you know, is now how do our sociologists see it, you know, this whole thing. Suddenly, first of all, they would say there is no proletariat anymore, you know. Um, that means instead of looking for the objective conditions under which the workers live, they look at the subjective consciousness which the workers have about their situation. So when in Marxist terms they are not proletarians, but are just workers who don't think about their situation, then they take their subjective consciousness as if it was an objective condition yes. and say we have no proletariat anymore, or we have no working class anymore, or we, we only have middle class. And that goes, you know, where education goes into the politicians. So when they run in office, McCain and, and Obama too, you know, when they address people, 
the middle class, they leave the law out. Then suddenly this plumber, they told the plumber came up there who had no plumbing uh, certificate, had no money to buy any plumbing business and had landed in the meantime in Israel as a journalist for... <laughs> I mean, this was the most idiotic thing. So it started with Obama, and then it was taken up by McCain, and so it was a like football. They kicked it back and forth. And uh, but then sometimes they said the hard-working middle class, and then it led over to some kind of the working class. But the reason is, if a politician would address you working class, nobody would listen to him. Everybody would hate his guts, and so therefore they cannot say it. They cannot use that word because people are not really proud of being, uh, they want to be middle class, you know, low middle class. And so there is a split between the two, but I think sociologists, uh, many of them, have decided to follow uh, this, you know, consciousness of people. So the same thing with doctor would say, uh, this patient, you know, doesn't have cancer. Why not? Because he does not think he has cancer. Or this patient has cancer because he thinks he has cancer. Now, but there are a lot of patients who think they have cancer and don't, and there are a lot of patients who don't think they have cancer, and they do have it. So there is the subjective and the objective side, and we find ourselves in a very strange sociological situation, namely a sociology which has become apologetic. Yes. It is, has become the apologetics of a late capitalistic society. And there, the critical theory, you know, does, um, does differ. That is the difference, you know. And that is why it is in the minority and not, uh, not a majority position. Could you say more about how they differ? Well, in, in the sense, you know, let me say we, we talked about this liberalism and I read it uh, today again. Um, for instance, Adorno would say that Hitler was the executioner of the liberal society. But then, at the same time, Hitler had a strong liberal element. He shared with liberalism all kinds of things. So, it is this double thing. So, a critical theorist would uh, have an ambiguous attitude, for instance, to the liberal society. As I said before, I said, you know, Marxism is, in a certain sense, the self-criticism of liberalism. So the, the, the critical theorists would not only be critical of liberalism, but also of a sociology which is liberal or which is an apologetics for, I mean, already to call our sociology to be an apologetics for liberal society would already be a position. I don't think that they would say that themselves. But um, you have to belong to another camp if you really say this that way. Can I have a clarification of the question? Yes. What question you're looking to answer? Did you, you want a distinction between modern sociology and critical theory? Yeah. That's, you know, I mean, I mean, I don't think ever. I mean, there are some people who combine. The, the, the subjective and the objective condition. I mean, you might not, we might not like Eric Olin right and his stuff, but I mean, he actually does, you know, break down some of the categories and says, well, there are some workers who do supervisory work, and you know, if we had a, if we actually offered a class in stratification, which I don't know if we ever ever do, we could. We kind of avoid that. Yeah, it seems like we do. So, so you know, uh, why you're laughing? So, you know, so we have work, we have some workers who are, you know, merely uh, sort of sort of academic workers, right? But then we have real, we still really do have factory workers in the country somewhere, and then we have uh, non-unionized factory workers, and then we have all these tens of millions of salespeople, right? and all these other services, some of which are real workers, like Ruby says, and then some of which are these sort of halfway between, you know, are you salaried or are you a salesman, so you're proffering some sort of product, and then there's managers. and So, you know, Wright and Burroway all talk about these, you know, it's not two categories, it's, 
you know, you know, what in classes Eric Holman writes has six or seven categories: high bourgeoisie, managerial bourgeoisie, uh, uh, imperial, color, imperial, life color, managerial color, proletariat, uh, yeah. uh, industrial proletariat, service proletariat, and then the you know whatever the lumpen. Let me just uh, you know, in order, in order to answer it concretely, uh, how a sociologist, how, how a critic of views like Adorno here talks about certain things. So let me try it. It's in German, but it is from his, uh, his damaged life, the minima moralia, uh, out of his little part of it. So just the same. So for instance here, uh, the German dominant clique, now when you should see that that's a German capitalistic ruling class, that means it is Krupp and Thyssen and it is Ford here and so on and in Germany it was the Herrn Club with Düsseldorf and so on. So already this to say, you know, that there is a ruling class you do have uh, somewhat, what is this guy, what is his name? There was one sociologist, he died very early, and he... You read Mills? Mills, he yeah, Mills, exactly, yeah. So, um, now, he was not a critical theorist, but he was certainly on the left, and he was certainly influenced by this type of thinking. So, even when you have, cert have certain sentences, already in, in the beginning, when he, somebody talks like that, or says, you know, the country is run by rackets, or something like that, you know, that's not apologetics, you know, that's not on the right. Let's, let's say, take that space sim symbolism, you know, which always have content. Content is more important than symbolism. So now the German, the German dominant clique pushed for the war, the Second World War, because it was excluded from the imperialistic power positions. I see that's the normal historian doesn't say that really. He gives a reason why the German power elite. Um, hired Hitler to do a certain job. Why? Because they were excluded from the imperialistic and the colonialistic power positions. That means we have Central America and South America and the Philippines as colonies. You wouldn't say this. American doesn't say this. This is not an American way to say things. Um, and then, of course, the British had India, you know, and they had part of Africa, and the French had part of Africa, and so on. So um, now, what did the German power elite and power want? They wanted what all the others had. That means cheap labor, cheap resources. Where could they get them? The colonies were stolen by the Allies in 1917, so they didn't have any colonies. <laughs> they were suffocating. When I, was, uh, when I was trained here then to democratize Germany, and I would say to the professor from Harvard, but the Germans have say, 60 million people, and they have only so many square miles, and so on. And he would say, well, buy a bill skyscrapers in Frankfurt and put potato gardens up on top of it. Do you really say that? No, seriousness, you know. He thought one could feed 16 million people by putting stuff on, on you think, that not even with Fritz Haber that was possible, you know. By the way, with this Malthusianism, you know, we have to think that Malthus was partially wrong with this formula because Malthus, uh, because uh, Fritz Haber, doubled the food supply by getting ammoniac out of the air. So that's why he got the Nobel Prize, you know. But that's just as a side thing. So let's just, uh, uh, when, when you just, you know, just words and, and just sentences, where you see right away, you know, that, it, that the wind blows from another direction. Uh, so they were excluded. Uh, so they, they pushed for the war because, well, not only Hitler, you know, so he's an evil man or whatever, but the power elite whose employee he was, this is all, no American sociologist would say this. So, um, so the, um, the, therefore this whole thing, you know, the books that by Henry Ford about international Jew and so on, you have to have a hard time, have a hard time to find that somewhere, you know. Or the, the protocol of the elders of sign which Ford, you know, he printed and whatever, you know. All that, I had to, 50, 40 years here, you know, you have to dig into this, and when you ask people, they say, how can you know that you didn't live here? This is usually the argument here. It means if you haven't lived somewhere, then you cannot know anything, in spite of the fact that 90% of all what we know, we know from somewhere else, you know. So, know that. Um, uh, well, in, uh, in such exclusion now, that's the fundamental category, in such exclusion, uh, lay at the same time the reason for that provinciality and this awkwardness and that blindness which Hitler and the Ribbentrop's politics made in, uh, unable to compete 
and uh, made their, uh, their, their war into a hazardous, into a hazard game. I don't know what that is. Is that, is that such a game? Hazard? Hazard? Uh, into a... And so it's, it's a highly risky type of a, of a, of a thing. And so, so, I mean, here, the, the uh, uh, first of all, you know, Adorno hated the Nazis. But in spite of the fact that he hated them, he asked what was their motivation, you know. That means there is some certain objectivity in that. We want to find out what motivated them. Not simply say he was a homosexual or he was sick or he had uh, schizophrenia or what or what. No, he wants to go to the objective ground of fascism, a movement to which he does not belong, which he does not like, which is on the other side. Uh, when, when Adorno was in Frankfurt in the university, there was a Nazi there who said that Adorno should be shot. And Adorno never made any comment about this. He is just very objectivating, you know, looked at this guy who wanted to shoot him. And he asked, why in God's name does he want to shoot me? You know, This type of an attitude is, we could almost say, objectivistic and materialistic. Because idealistic means to emphasize the consciousness. The sociologist who takes the middle class consciousness, the fraudulent one, you know, as a reality, is an idealist. It's an idealistic, apologetic type of a thing. Materialistic means that you come with the overpowering reality outside there. The reality principle, the reality principle, you know. And uh, you can see that moment where Bush, for instance, said, I don't want to do it, we don't want to do it, we don't want to do it. And then he starts to nationalize and to federalize and so on. That means it hit him, you know, and he suddenly had to do something completely different than whatever he thought. I, all idealism went out, the, uh, the, all Friedman idealism went out the window. So, and so it will continue, you know. Well, that means if, after a little while, if they should stabilize the whole thing, yesterday stock market went up to 360% today, the points today went 4% up or whatever. Um, let's see, they could stabilize in the last, next four years. They cannot repeat the, the Reagan thing again and deregulate again. Uh, because even in a shorter time than this time, they would be in another catastrophe. And I'm afraid they may try this. The temptation of what you hear from the commentaries, not only in, in Fox News or so, but the CNN as, as well, you know. Behind all that is, we have to do this only now, this federalization, and so on, so that we return to the free market again. And so on. Not a social market like the Europeans, not even that, but the real free market, you know, as the Reagan guys and, and the Chicago School had it. And it won't work. I mean, this will only prolong the, the agony of this country. Okay, but a few more of these sentences there. Um, so, um, behind that is also that Hitler was a low bourgeois type of a guy, which we tried to make clear to Jim there, you know. That means they were provincial. Rippentrop was, uh, was a, a salesman, of, uh, a wine salesman, and that's all the experience he had, you know. And that Hitler never left the country. Uh, Hitler was uh, in France, of course, as a soldier, and then he visited Mussolini and so on. Otherwise, he, uh, he only went into countries which he conquered. And he went to Paris. He had never been in Paris. Then he, you know, after the victory, he visited the Paris in the morning when everybody was asleep still. But, uh, you know, had no foreign contact. So it's a very provincial type of a myopic, myopic type. Um, so, but, you know, behind that, there is a certain understanding now in Adorno. Namely, that Italy and Germany had somewhat been shortchanged among the capitalistic nations, you know, so that Mussolini also with Ethiopia and so on came too late, they all came too late, the others had already stolen it all because there is only so much, you know, and, and therefore I always say Hitler's plan, and that was the plan of his power elite, to establish now colonies uh, up to the Volga and into to the Ural maybe and why, when he was in Moscow, you know, at the airport where we, where we were there, um, why he then did not offer a, 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 an armistice to Stalin, who was on his way out behind the Ural, you know, he was down on Seoul, you know. He could have gotten an armistice gotten, and he could have gotten the Ukraine, you know, and, 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 and other territories as well. No, he had to go the whole way, you know. Because the German high bourgeoisie, and that's where it's all good in theory, you know, that they needed 
cheap labor and cheap resources because capitalism needs always more cheap labor and so on. And you can do it peacefully only when the others give you the cheap labor and the resources and so on. But when like Stalin, they resist it and they don't want to give it to you, then you have to make war. So it was in Iraq now. And so it was in Afghanistan. The, 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 the pipelines have to go to Afghanistan and, and the former government was not willing to, to open it up. So that is why, why this, so that is pretty good theory, language, from an authentic source there. In, in such a uh, case, then, um, da, 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 da. okay, that's it, the, uh, the balance between the economic uh, total uh, situation and the British particular situation in terms of the toys, you see, the analysis goes very much into, into detail, and that was Churchill, and uh, concerning, and the illusions concerning the strengths of the Red Army, uh, and that they were so badly informed, so bad intelligence about the strength of the army, you know. When, when he went up to Finland, you know, and talked with Mannerheim, um, 1943, Hitler flew, uh, as we flew recently to, to, uh, to uh, what was it, St. Petersburg, um, Hitler flew the same way, you know, and there were Allied airplanes in the air, it was a very risky thing, you know, so he flew up to Helsinki. And, and somebody turned on the, the tape recorder and, and the tape has been found, you know, in a wonderful Austrian melodious speech, you know, no shouting, no screaming, but as persuasive as possible he talked to Mannerheim and he said there, he said, you know, a government which is able to put 10,000 tanks into the, into the battle, you know, in such a short time has to be respected, you know. So by that time, 43, you know, he knew that his intelligence had been bad, you know. Of course, some of the tanks came over Murmansk. Okay, so the, um, the balance, so it, it, and, and the British particular interest in the toys and the strength of the, that they were not informed about that, um, uh, as, as uh, they were as blind as the masses to whom they talked. That means they did almost not know more than the masses who uh, jubilated to them you know, in the cage of the Third Reich, there in this provincialism, um, then the, um, so that cannot, these, these uh, things that cannot be excluded from the historical determination of National Socialism, um, and from, from its energy and its power. So that means this narrow-mindedness, you know, belongs to National Socialism essentially, and belongs to its power. You know, the Jesuits sometimes sent always send the most stupid guy in order to do something practical. Because the others, you know, who can think, think about the consequences and all these things and never get to action. So the now more narrow-minded a Jesuit is, the more powerful will be his action. Uh, there is something in this in terms of American activism, you know, which is also in the student, was also in the student movement, you know. Not enough theory, but, you know, theory uh, takes time and never gets anywhere. They're just babbling all the time. So let's act, you know. And the more now the mind is, the more intense will be the action. So this is a wonderful analysis, you know, of, uh, of uh, fascism. So the chance, the chance to... Uh, um, to, to a, a risky type of action consisted in that um, that they did not know it any better. So, um, you know, the narrowness, the limitations of their consciousness had something to do with the energy which they could, were able to put into the action. And that was at the same time the reason for their uh, defeat in the end. Um, Germany's industrial backwardness uh, has the politicians, um, the, uh, had the politicians who wanted to catch up with this, um, and which appeared thereby as people who don't have anything, um, uh, pointed them to their immediate, very narrow type of experience, um, the, the 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 political facade. So. That means they believed their own facade. They did not see um, more before themselves as the, the gathering there of the people 
to whom they spoke and who jubilated to them. So they all blindly went with him. And, um, the, and the, of course the uh, frightened uh, um, uh, partners, diplomatic partners like uh, 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 Chamberlain, for instance, or the representative of uh, Czechoslovakia, Benish, um, he got a heart attack, you know, while he was talking to Hitler. Hitler shouted at him, you know, and then Hitler brought his doctor in from Berlin and he treated him. And then later on, Hitler said to the doctor, he said, I hope you didn't treat him too well because then we don't get through with, your, with our negotiations. That means that... Uh, to shout him to pieces was part of the negotiation. So now when he wakes up again, you know, he's strong again, <laughs> we cannot negotiate well with him. And so, so this is all. Uh, but I mean, they, what we see, what comes together in this critical theory is sociology and psychoanalysis at the same time. You know, so this, and you don't find that on the other side. I mean, you do find in Parsons, you know, an influence of Schütz, Schütz's phenomenology, and you find in Parsons also an influence of psychoanalysis, and so on. But it does not determine the whole thing. You know, the system is so overwhelming, you know, that Schütz and Freud are deeply integrated. <laughs> and it was easier for Schütz. Schütz was a banker, you know. He only on the side worked in the new school, uh, on only after he was finished as a banker, after he made the millions as a banker, he taught a little bit. Uh, okay, so um, the, um, the, so the okay that that blocked somehow for the Nazis the insight into the objective force of the larger masses of capital. Now, say so you see to bring that in the larger masses of capital into the analysis. Now that was all critical theory. I mean, so um, then uh, it is it is the imminent revenge against Hitler, that he, the executioner of the liberal society, was nevertheless, according to the status of his own conscience, still too liberal in order to know how under the cover of liberalism outside in the other countries, uh, the unresistible domination of the industrial potential formed itself. That means he was too idealistic. He did not uh, see, you know, the power of this industrial and capital power of England and France and, uh, and the United States and, and so on and so on. He was a bit bourgeois and he had a narrow type of a consciousness, uh, a petit bourgeois consciousness. Uh, and um, then um, the uh, okay he, uh, who, like no other Hitler, he, who, like no other citizen, or no other bourgeois, the Germans have the word burger for bourgeois and citoyen, so you can take either, or, or so. Uh, so Hitler, who, no, like no other bourgeois, uh, recognized and looked through the untruth of liberalism, namely its atomistic character, which is unable to deal with collective affairs like New Orleans, or this crisis, or the old people, or the 48 million people without health insurance. They just can't think it. They can think only the individual, the narcissistic type, autistic type of individual, is the starting point of all of the thinking. There you have an unbelievable difference between the liberal sociology or a liberalism which is critical of itself, which would be the critical theory. <coughs> okay, so uh, the um, uh, so Hitler, who saw the untruth of liberalism and looked through it, also the parliamentarism, which is part of that liberalism, you know, this that they, they had a depression, they had an inflation, and they discussed and discussed, you know, in the, in the Weimar Republic and so the Parliament and didn't get anywhere. And when he then stood up and said there were 20 parties or whatever, and, and none of them got anywhere, and so on, then, then of course the masses, you know, jubilated. So, so then, um, so the guy who looked through this, Hitler looked through this, uh, and uh, um, who, who looked through um, 
the, 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 the power of, well, who saw the untruth in liberalism um, did nevertheless not look at the whole power which stands behind liberalism that means the social tendency in liberalism which is the social tendency of capital against which he a priori was powerless and could not make it so um, this shows you know how one loves one's enemy that means he uh, Adorno is able to look through the eyes even of the man who you know killed six million of his own brothers and sisters Jewish people, about which they by the way were also ashamed they were all ashamed that they survived you know they felt guilty because they survived because they had left and left their brothers in Auschwitz <coughs> ok so, so Hitler saw the, the weakness but he did not see the social tendency and here again we don't have that you know when we for instance have the future studies and we talk about future 1, 2 and 3 that how the hell can you say something about the future the future does not exist you know so you cannot talk about something which doesn't exist well one can talk about something which does exist already and namely the tendency the tendency toward alternative future one the total computerization of the society the robotization of society the more bureaucratization of society and so on. these tendencies can be seen tendencies in literature toward alternative future three a free society a society in which this autonomy would be reconciled with solidarity and so on tendencies where they are in religion too in mythology and so on everywhere these tendencies can be found or tendency toward militarism you just have to look at the military budget you know in, in comparison to the other budget for health and, and education and so on there you see tendencies the tendencies are empirical they can be seen and the question if one see, can see the potential in what is the case that means the potential in what the positivist sees as being a fact and a data so, so the, the, the right will see those data but is there a way to see in the data the, uh, the potential the evolutionary potential so Hegel already thought that Europe was finished and that the Slavic world and the American world would have the greater evolutionary potential why? because they hadn't done anything yet that is a simple thing so whenever I flew here in the past you know over these areas what have these people done here you know in the last 400 years or whatever they had their farms and they fed their cows and they had sex and they read the Bible these are all very you know very nice activities but they don't come up to anything what the Romans did or what the Greeks did or what the Turks did or whatever you know so nothing has happened yet really so uh, therefore since uh, you know it would be very amazing if that more would happen than has happened already so therefore I always have expressed to you my, my optimism concerning the potential of the American people which is strangled by this type of a system now and hopefully they will throw off the, 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 the skin you know like the snake or they will suffocate in the skin for some time you know like the turtle and the little house ok so just these examples you know for, uh, for how this type of, of dialectical thinking uh, the, so, so he is not aware of the uh, uh, social tendencies for which Hitler at the same time was the drummer boy you know uh, that is so these paradoxical type of things have all been calmed down in Parsons or in functionalism or whatever so um, Hitler's consciousness is on the standpoint of the um, uh, of the uh, man who um, uh, he speaks a very, very complicated German Absolutely. Well, the verbs are at the end, right? Okay. Well, um, so I mean, maybe this is, is enough there to to make clear. So, in the end, in the end, he says the statement which also no positivist would say: that the stupidity of Hitler was the cunning of reason. So, this cunning of reason comes from Hegel's philosophy of history, which, by the way, Habermas and the younger ones have given up and replaced it by an evolutionary theory 
Um, so uh, the cunning of reason means that providence uses the terrible things but also the limitation and the stupidity and the passions of the people who have no idea about the idea uh, and just are driven by their instincts and so on but providence or reason or the cunning of reason uses it against themselves or uses uh, so in, in that sense you know um, Hitler produced a situation which verified uh, Hegel namely when the American troops the first the Russian troops and the American troops uh, appeared in Berlin uh, some people did remember that hundred years earlier the president of the university there had said exactly that that the American and the Slavic world and then so on will take the place of Europe and, uh, and how did he know this? first of all by an unbelievable accumulation of material so uh, Hegel was the best read person probably in Europe at that time in the natural sciences and the social sciences and so on. and the other thing is the dialectical method determinate negation the combination of that makes it possible to see very clearly what somebody will have to do you know in, in terms of so for, for eight years or so we talked about this uh, um, Roosevelt liberalism and we talked about the other one the, the Reagan thing to break that off and so on and what the consequence of that would be and that the nation did really the right thing by choosing uh, the uh, um, choosing the Roosevelt liberalism and that's what they do now New Deal if the British guy came here last week you know Brown and then said you know we need a global New Deal and so on so then he's a social democrat he's a Labour Party guy so um, and now there is combined with this is right away an illusion again and the illusion that a New Deal will rescue capitalism mm -hmm. and that will simply not happen so you see there is progress and in the progress you see at the same time the weakness and so on that is dialectical thinking and it's beautiful it's aesthetically beautiful and, uh, but it is also truthful uh, and so that is the difference between, between the two sides so I mean this last sentence shows also you know where all that comes from it comes from Hegel it comes from Schelling it comes from Kant it comes from Schopenhauer it comes from Freud it comes from Marx so we cannot just call them you can't say now you know that looks this, this analysis would not be possible without Marx but th does that already make him a Marxist, you know? Because in the next page you will see, you know, that he talks about Nietzsche, uh, who cleans up all the untruth, you know, which had accumulated in bourgeois society, and describes him as the most mild and, and beautiful and, and, and so on person. Uh, and, and he, one could easily say, that Adorno learned more from Nietzsche than he learned from Marx or from Hegel together, you know. So that type of Nietzsche who stands in the street of Basel, you know, and somebody hits on the horse, and the horse cannot pull the wagon up the hill, and, and so he's beaten, and Nietzsche goes over and praises the horse and weeps, and so um, that is the Nietzsche which the French don't know, and the Nietzsche which the Nazis did not know, and, and so on and so on. But uh, so there is, uh, up to Habermas and, and the, his followers and so on, there's a wonderful ability, you know, to get into this thinking and psyche of people and, and clean all that ideological abuse of these people to clean that up, which is uh, uh, very good. So, so that may be, does that help somehow to, so one has to take the real text, you know, in a particular context that was written in the 50s or 60s or so. Um, the, the, in order to see, you know, that there is a really world of difference between the two. It's a completely different way of thinking. And if you characterize, you know, the sociology which you have, then, well, let's take, you know, the, the great, I mean, Parsons was a, was a great man in many ways. So, uh, but the harmonizing, you know, is something which is absolutely contrary to what critical theory does, you know. It shows the antagonisms and it is not willing to harmonize them in order to play the apologetics of the present late liberal society as it is disappearing. <laughs> I would okay. like to return to the class discussion. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I wanted to talk about the first paragraph, uh, my criticism of Marcuse. Okay. Yeah. 
While I agree with Marcuse's sociological observation concerning how the new instruments of production have increased the availability of leisure time, I take issue with what he sees as the primary characteristics of the proletariat. From my reading of Marx, the other characteristics of the proletariat are three, mental exhaustion, which severely hinders the proletariat from being critical, comparative, and developing his or her humanity. Four, their inability to keep the surplus value, which, sever, which severely hinders the proletariat from owning the instruments of production, the necessary tools for cutting the chains of exploitation, which in turn will allow the proletariat to free themselves from the ideas that we can only live if we are exploited. Five, the inability to determine the direction and goals of their existence. And six, the inability to love and be loved in a non-exploitive, non-oppressive, non-instrumental way. To put it more sharply, Marcuse is either bracketing out or de-emphasizing the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth characteristics of the proletariat in favor of the characteristics one and two. In addition, Marcuse makes no distinction between passive leisure activities watching TVs, moving, attending professional sporting events, etc., and active leisure activities. Understand, I'm not arguing that Marcuse is in error when he points out that the proletariat has changed and has become more complacent, lethargic, and has capitulated to the ideology of the high bourgeois, like so many other groups of house slaves in human history. What I see as an error is Marcuse's emphasis that the proletariat is a beast of burden that is being worked and starved to death. This paints a distorted picture in the reader's mind of those, excuse me, reader's mind of who the proletariat is and what they need. To summarize my criticism more succinctly, Marxism denounces more than just the physical pain and misery of labor. It also denounces the mental pain, economic injustice, the lack of self-determination, and bourgeois love. Which page was that on? Page three. First full paragraph. Yeah, okay. So, now... Well, I want to get at the criticism here, because with Marcuse talking about the proletariat in the sense that they are physically beaten down, they waste so much time, they're exhausted, as being the key and only real element of them being a proletariat. And then this, this change here, he's, he's saying that we don't have a proletariat because, like Ludo, you know, where we have, you know, someone who makes $100,000 a year because they fly a plane, right? I don't care how much money they make. Take away their paycheck. They're dead in the water. And they they have, have no health insurance. They have no health insurance. Health insurance. Oh, okay. They don't own the plane. They can't get the gas. They're, you know, I don't care whether they're you know, at Kmart or flying a plane. The amount of money does not determine whether you're a pro or not, a proletariat. Okay. Well, so let's look at this for a moment where my cousin comes from. So the idea of shortening the labor hours was, of course, a very, was a very important idea for Marx and for the whole socialist movement. So he called it work 12 hours, you know. And mm -hmm. if you work 12 hours, then you really have no time. Six to, days a week. Do six days a week, yeah, and so on. So um, therefore that was a goal also of the labor union, socialistic labor unions too, to get the labor hour down. So, and they did, you know. So somehow the Marcuse registers that this succeeded in a certain sense. It was, was possible. We also have to see, you know, that we have that movie even on Marcuse fighting against Reagan. Mm -hmm. So when Reagan undid Roosevelt, you know, then Marcuse fought him, and not only in California, but even went to France and so on where he uh, uh, rebelled against him and so on. So it was a bitter struggle and Marcuse died earlier before Reagan won. Reagan won, you know, and Marcuse lost and the whole thing. But we could say unfortunately now because what Obama does now is exactly to undo Reagan like Reagan undid Roosevelt and returns to Roosevelt again. So that's exactly what we, what we are doing at this moment. So, but now I think the other things, you know, that if you have the three hours now, you know, eight, like eight hours instead of 12 or 16 or whatever, that is not the solution of the problem yet, you know, that is not, that one is in alternative future number three, namely the realm of freedom on the realm of the basis of necessity. The realm of necessity has been pushed back in a certain sense, so theoretically the realm of freedom is now open. Also the scarcity has been overcome, but there I would criticize him too. 
he talks in Western terms, you know. We usually forget all the people outside yes. who are in the colonial territories and are still, you know, neocolonialism or whatever, exploited as always and ever, you know. So what he talks about are the workers in Germany and in England and in America or whatever. But even those workers now what to do with that free time, you know. Do they become couch potatoes or you know, the propaganda machine, the television, and so on. So this is all, I mean, your criticism is then justified. There is, you know, this Caspi has been overcome. And some of her marks, Caspi and ruling class were hanging together. I don't understand it completely, I think. But they think if the Caspi is overcome, there is no need anymore for a ruling class. And my cousin thinks somehow that this Caspi problem has been overcome. That means we have the potential to give everybody clothing and food and housing and then so on and so on. But we don't do it. Why not? Because we use it for the war. You know, the Vietnam War was going on and so on. And so we are wasting billions and billions. I mean, think of the trillions which we have spent for the Iraq War. You know, and Afghanistan won't continue to be spent. Even to bring the troops back now will cost billions of dollars, you know. And uh, to speak that we have to you know, uh, you will now negotiate with the, uh, with the Afghan, Afghan guys too, because and they will not talk to him now, because they're winning. They're already uh, moving toward Kabul, you know. They will take over Kabul, and, and uh, he may be too late, you know. There was a time when Bush could talk with these, what are they called, uh, you know, fundamentalists there. Uh, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan yeah, too. Also Taliban? Taliban, yeah. The Pakistan oh, government yeah. seems, seems, to, seems to fall <laughs> too. So it may be a little bit. When people are winning, you know, they are not really willing to discourse now. So um, he needs an incentive to, to make them talk under these circumstances because uh, the, the government in, in uh, Pakistan seems to be falling too uh, today. And, uh, so that's a, another issue. So. Um, okay, the, your criticism is well well taken there, so the question is, you know, after we have the shorter and shorter hours, you could even say, what's wrong with unemployment then, you know, because that gives you full time at home. <laughs> but uh, Half pay. Yeah, half pay or no pay or whatever, but uh, you see, unemployment uh, is, is a precarious type of a leisure time because, you know, when you are conditioned, because they are still conditioned, you know, that work really gives value to their life. That means the value of their life, the meaning of their life is to produce surplus value. Mm -hmm. And when they don't produce surplus value, that's what their masters instilled in them. Then they have a bad conscience. And not only because they have no money, but they also have no self-esteem and self-value because they think they are of no, of no use. And use their family will tell them that. that. Yes, yeah, family will their wives. The social yeah. group will their wives, their wives will tell them that. Their wives will tell them that. Will tell them that because Saint Paul, you know, who does not work should not eat. That's the only thing what the liberals really have taken serious in the in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. so, uh, that you know that so this therefore that ruins you know all happiness which could come with this free time. But there's also other, one has to be educated in order to make something out of time and not to be bored. Because people, when they have time, they may be bored now, you know. I don't understand. I have n never been bored in my life. So, But one has to learn what to do with leisure time now. Play the flute or like, you know, Marx makes it uh, ironically to go out in the morning, you know, and work in the garden and then write a critical article and then make some music and whatever. So that uh, the realm of freedom means really that the potential of seeing and hearing and touching and feeling and analysis and uh, dialectics and so on, and, uh, you know, speculation and uh, whatever, that this is all developed, you know. So... But that can only occur when, when the entire society has been yeah. reorganized. So exactly. what is Marcuse saying? He's saying this can be all achieved before uh, a, a reworking of the mode of production? Is that what he's trying to say? He gives these four categories, right, of what happened to the proletariat, and then says, well, they're not fat and complacent. There is no reason to talk about them. They will not change. They oh, are not okay. the he leaves the, We they have to go outside. Them. We have to go outside, right? I don't know how far outside. So, so where does he 
is, I mean, his, so this is why he's this darling of the student movement, right, in the 60s, because the student movement was the new vanguard for him, or so, so they loved him because he says the students and the, the lumpens and the ghetto, the, the right? So this is why he's but the student student liberation of minorities, but also third world liberation movement. But the students, students mm-hmm. were not workers students. No. They were middle class students, mm-hmm. low middle class and middle class students. And the worker connection and the students happened in Paris. So in Paris the workers and the students marched together. But that was the only place where it really happened. And even there it broke down. So, um, uh, but it was really a bourgeois type of a movement, you know. And that is the amazing, was the unexpected way, you know, because those who had it all and whose parents, you know, had a nice home and a nice marriage and so on. They were the ones who were really rebelling, you know. This is what they so talk about, Zizek and Henri Lévy. Mm-hmm. The question is, the critical yeah. theory has still a group, you know, a social stratum to be rooted in is behind all that, you know. Because they had hoped that the workers in Europe would rise against the uh, capitalistic group and Hitler and so on. But they let themselves being seduced by Hitler, you know. National socialism, they still say today, this is socialism, you know, and so on. But they, that it was really nationalism which used socialism to some extent. Some socialistic things were used, you know. For instance, no taxation for workers because that was all paid with the profits which they made from other people whom they conquered and, and so on. So, or uh, all people, Hitler would say, like the emperor had said in 1914, I know no classes anymore, you know. So he appeared as uh, the classless. Like, I'm a little man, you know, I'm coming from below. And people identified with that little man who had made it. So um, the people also ate a pot of soup, I think, every four weeks. All families of all classes ate the same soup, uh, bean soup or whatever. So that was something. The Volkswagen, you know, that everybody could have a car, uh, which was the T model here of Ford. There was an imitation. And also the highways where I lost my way yesterday, that was a first fort every minute I drove up here. The, 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 you know, that system was also, it imitated that as well. So, um, okay, so that is the problem. Uh, the, uh, there is no real scarcity anymore. Um, people have shorter hours. So what else has to be done now, you know, that is the question in terms of Marcuse, in order to come to alternative future number three, the realm of freedom on the realm of necessity. Uh, right? That is where he stands? No, he stands at the idea that why should the totally administrative societies and those who advocate it want change? If we get better than our parents, our grandparents, and our great-grandparents, and we're told what to think and what to feel and what is good and what is bad, why in God's name would they want to give it up? Yeah. But I mean, our own freedom that may be beneficial to them, right? But There's no reason, but, right, for that. Are we vote. already in alternative future number one, you know, which would be the administered society? So, for instance, uh, Adorno, Adorno thought we were in there. Horkheimer thought we still had a little bit time to go there. Habermas thinks we can never get there because it would be a society which is torn off of its linguistic foundation and this is unthinkable because the five human potentials belong to our species being and if this would be torn off we would become another species. So you have these different opinions, you know, and and so does Marcuse really think we are already in the administered society or does he simply think because people have less working hours now and because they have something to eat and they have a little house and so on, therefore they don't think to go any further anymore <coughs> and want to stay there, you know, and are not willing to make any revolution anymore because, you know, the proletariat was that stratum which had nothing to lose. And because they had nothing to lose, they were revolutionary. But now they do have something to lose a little house and a job and, and so on, so therefore they become complacent, you know.
and don't go to alternative future number three anymore, but can be led to alternative future number two. Because the last hundred years almost looks like flip-flopping between alternative future number one and number two. Right. We have the total administrators, yeah, right. uh, Marcuse says, the welfare state. Yeah. Right. And then when there are problems right, with the flow of money or surplus value, we go to the war state, right, yeah. and production goes through the roof, we get new territories, we have new consumers. Then when that all breaks down, then we go back to the welfare state. Well, there are combined them, and is it the welfare state at home, and there's a war state outside. Yeah. Okay. Rudy, it's 8 o'clock. Do you want to take a break? Uh, yes. Okay, let's take a bite. Enjoy your cookies. It's Nikolaus Budimir, yes. great thinker. Oh no! Oh, really? So it's no uh, longer in the hospital. <laughs> <Schmuck. laughs> what is the critical theory of society? Critical theory of the fact that school begins with a philosophical base in Kant's exploration of the condition. That's very good. The possibilities of knowledge. So it's based epistemology. So. But they vacillated all this, you know. Sometimes they are Kantians and then they become Hegelians. And, and the reason is, Kant is, of course, this great critical guy, so he destroys religion, metaphysics, and so on. But then you stand there without any meaning, you know. And then you go over to Hegel, and he promises you that he will be as critical as his teacher, Kant, but at the same time you can have a positive metaphysics still and a positive religion, and so on. So, but then they say, how the hell does this Hegel know this? <laughs> and then they go back to Kant, you know. So in the meantime, the Habermas and the others, they are all Kantians, you know, more than they are Hegelians. That's so, like he's always talking about Kant and, right, and the yeah, Universal yeah, yeah, Declaration yeah, of Human Rights. Right. right. All that, okay. And the okay, cosmological okay. thing which yeah. Hegel... Hegel uh, rejected, you know, the idea of a, of a world government or whatever, but Chris Habermas is, is uh, moving that in that direction, you know, because Hegel saw the negativity in every particular nation state, and this negativity would, uh, would then again, of course, find the enemy. What he calls that war is not avoidable when the nature of things require it, and the nature of things is, of course, you know, the, the nation state which, because of its particularity, has this negativity in itself. It gets along with other states, but at a certain time it appears that the other states have to be attacked. And, so, and, so, and therefore, even if uh, it's a League of Nations, you know, which came under Hegel, and later on the, the uh, no, League of Nations was the, second, the First World War, but before that there was a High Holy Alliance, so the Holy Alliance of Austria and so on, the Holy Alliance and the League right, of right, Nations yes. and the UN. Even these bodies, you know, have their own negativity and therefore they always need some kind of an enemy, a rogue nation or whatever, against which they can develop their, their uh, uh, union, you know, their unity. They cannot keep their inner unity without an external enemy. That is simply necessary. That's metaphysically necessary. So you could say you get the human species together only if you would discover an enemy on Mars or somewhere, you know. Then you could get them all together. But before that happens, that there will be no eternal peace or whatever. So yeah, I told you that story that I read in a news in a little journal in a news in an airplane to Saga, our story about my crew and what we did, and it said uh, American professor discussed Kant's eternal peace in Hotel Argentina while the serfs were bombing the whole hotel on top of it. <laughs> it was a weird, funny type of thing. They didn't even laugh in this article, you know, it was extremely ironic. So it doesn't, you know, th this was Hagen's position. So they, at the moment, you know, the younger ones, and these are the guys we want to mention there, uh, are more, much closer to Kant than to, uh, to Hegel. Also, you know, Hegel would say, you know, that this uh, agnosticism is not acceptable. Hegel thought he knew something about God, and uh, the Kantian thing, but don't know anything about God. So this is, they are all on the, on the Kantian side at, at the moment, you know. But then other things, you know, they swing back again. Um, okay, so, uh, very good. Then we have here... Um, from this philosophical background, petit bourgeois and big bourgeois see intellectuals responding to the historical development of their times set out to answer a number of new questions confronting left academics. So, 
there is this, what is it called, non-conformist intellectuals, I think is the term, and the Frankfurt School people were part of this. Okay, um, the um, first, second, and so on, the potential. So the first potential would be language and memory, the second one would be work, the third one would be um, love, sex, and the fourth one, recognition, the fifth one, nationhood. So you go through this, it's very good. So, but we have the first generation, you know, still is very much on work and tool, and that means also the productive forces and the productive relations, and so kind of Marx had that, uh, emphasized that uh, thing, this uh, uh, poten second potential. And then comes the linguistic turn, you know, into to the idea that not the class struggle uh, is important, but this combination between language, discourse, and recognition, um, that somehow one could get to alternative future number three, not by class struggle, maybe not by progressive taxation or whatever, but the shift over is now uh, the public discourse, the discovery of the public sphere, uh, public opinion and press and, and all that. So that is where Habermas then, uh, you know, emphasizes. And, and that was a good move, uh, except if that uh, productive thing is forgotten, you know, then he becomes conservative and they make him into a church father. And then there are attempts like this. This driver, you know, with this uh, Tillich and, and the other guy, Hirsch, he has a chapter on, on uh, Habermas, you know, so... And the religious people think he has converted. I, I told Habermas, I told the, uh, the, the Jim that Habermas made clear, you know, open in the press that he had become old but not pious. Had become old and not pious because what these pious people always hope for is that guys who were atheists or whatever, in the end they return to the cross and call on their knees and uh, to the cross. And so Habermas has made perfectly clear that this is not what is happening with him. So. <coughs> Can I ask a real quick question? Yeah. It's a bit of a side Always. note, but um, of the five human uh, potentials, mm -hmm. the fifth one uh, for nationhood, does that necessarily, I mean, does that necessarily require government? Well, no, not the, I mean, it could first be tribes, you know, it could be nations, uh, um, it could be a nation can always form a nation state, but not necessarily so. I mean, the Jews, you know, had no state for 2,000 years and were just held together by the law and no government. It's, of course, an amazing type of an exception, you know. But, I mean, people who struggle for statehood, for instance, and, I mean, the development of Israel, you know, you have tribal society and only with Moses, you know, something slowly like a state develops, you know, and, and then after the exile, the state is miserable, weak, you know, and is destroyed completely in the year 70 or 124, and for 2,000 years, no state, but the, a nation, you know. Uh, so, um, so it, it is, it's kept more, more general, but you can say, you know, who, what, what people make of this. After the union, you know, which religion provided for people in the West, collapsed, and that it happened with the Hegel system, then people had to find a, another basis for unity of their thought, and so on. And so then the Freud would take sexuality, it would take the third uh, potential. You know. Now he has others too, you know, it's exactly, I mean he also talked about selfishness and about the killer instincts and so on, but there was a certain emphasis on on the uh, human potential there. Another one, Adler or so, would take the recognition thing, and so did Nietzsche, you know, and so did Hitler, etc. Uh, but that was not Hitler's main thing. Hitler's main thing was that nation thing, you know. So what the nationalists, you know, if it's Hitler, Mussolini, or Reagan, or whatever, they push the number five button. But the number five button is so unbelievably powerful because it contains the others. Because the nation, there's the nation's language, you know. It reproduces its language. It uh, is, has its own economic reproduction. It has its own biological reproduction, you know. It has its own uh, power reproduction in terms of mutual recognition and such. So uh, this, is, this uh, nationhood there is the most powerful of all the five because it contains all the others, you know. With this one, you push all the others as well. 
So nationalists will say, no, not Spanish is the main language, but English is the main Spanish, or not French in, in Canada now, but English or so, you know. So it goes into language, it goes into intermarriage things, you know, not to marry uh, people from another nation or whatever, uh, as we have it with the Jews, you know, and, and uh, other people too. Then when Tito comes, you know, suddenly you have this intermarriage between the different nations. So the people I visited, there was a Serb, who was married with a Croat, and but they had to flee the country, you know, because, and there were a lot of divorces going on afterwards after the counter-revolution broke through, you know, where people Serb and, and uh, Croats separated and couldn't stay together anymore and so on. So, so, uh, and, uh, so that, that makes somehow uh, a picture, you know, and, and language, of course, you know, uh, the fellow, what is it? He is a great language guy there. Chomsky? Chomsky? Not Chomsky, no, the older one, the engineer. Uh, Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein yeah, they, they all come from Wittgenstein. So their, their language is put in memory, you know, is put into the center. And for these theologians like Metz or so, that is important because Judaism stressed this as such a very meek, you know, category of memory and, and so Christianity as well. So that's why, you know, Habermas became their man and, and so on. So, but, uh, so we have some people who consider, and then they try to, uh, uh, in a certain sense, all of them try to re find new unity. So if Freud emphasizes sex, he also emphasizes language in a certain sense, because he, with his patients, you know, he did not go physically from outside any longer, but he talked with them about what is going on inside. So that means it's a new reorganization. As the unifying religious principle disappears, uh, they make something inadvertently into the main principle of union, and that is really the turn of materialism. Because idealism means that one starts with an idea which is before nature, and when one becomes a methodological atheist like Habermas does, that is what is excluded, but also with Marx already. And then the starting point is not this something before nature, but nature and what evolves out of nature. That is language and work. And to the certain traces of all that is in the animal world already. In the animal world there is already a beginning of language, there is already a beginning of work, you know, some... Chimpanzees take a little straw and get ants out of the thing. They, they use tools already. And so, of course, sex and then, of course, also struggle of recognition. There are apes in Japan, you know, who run up a tree. They mount a female somewhere, but only symbolically, and then go up to the top of the tree and shake it back and forth in order to say, I am really the top guy, you know. That's the struggle of recognition. I really made it up there. And when you go to the zoo, in fact, when I studied that many, many times, so there sits a guy there, uh, whatever, ape there, up there, and he has usually a little red fur around his neck or whatever, and he's stronger than the others, and the others sit all below him, like a pope or a president, and when somebody comes up, boom, he beats on the head, and then they go on their place again, you know. It's a hierarchical type of an order, it's an order of recognition. So beginnings of all five are there, but then, you know, the unbelievable progress is made in tool making or, you know, in order of recognition and, and all this. Okay, so that is how you structure the whole thing, and that is uh, very good. Um, you mentioned there uh, the critical theories, of course, Adorno, Hocker, from Herbert, I asked to have add to it Pollock. Pollock, um, he was very important, he was the closest friend of. Uh, of, uh, mm, I, don't, uh, I just don't know enough about yeah. him. And Bloch, so one could add to it. And you mentioned a few others uh, afterwards there. Um, so you, you had a few others, but uh, uh, what is the... Um, was that woman who helped... Um, uh, Gundla or whatever, who helped uh, um, Benjamin over the border there. And he was there too. So they, they, they were more in that institute at Columbia University. That we, we usually know only those who, you know, were the most prolific. And, and then, so I mentioned that the first, what well, the first, second, and so on uh, thing is, you say something about rational future into more barbarism, and you call that the Golgotha of history. That comes from 
of Hegel there, you know, where he becomes as uh, realistic as Schopenhauer is really when he comes to the empirical description of, uh, of historical process. That means the society is very good. Um, so uh, there you are, yeah, Grünberg and Grossmann. Now, uh, Grünberg was one of the two directors before Horkheimer, and they were the Cathedra uh, uh, communists because they were the first ones who were allowed to teach in the university, first Marxists to talk in the teach in the university. And they, they explicitly did, uh, what, what Grünberg yeah. did explicit economic yeah. uh, work with, with these sort of long ways of development. Right. That was uh, they're a real Marxist thing. And they had the connection with the Mos Moscow Institute, too, which, which did not last when, when Horkheimer came in. But early, yeah, uh, David uh, Diazimov, and, and I thought that was interesting. Yeah. That there were and then there is the authoritarian personality, and you have, you know, dogmatic, masochistic, and romantic, and so uh, usually when one, when one gathers it, what they say, but a form invented that. So on one side you have the authoritarian, which would be the fascist and the bourgeois personality, and which is the having personality in the later stages of form. It becomes the having personality versus the being <coughs> kind of personality. And on the other side you have the revolutionary personality. That's how Fromm called it first. When he came over here, he called it the democratic personality. So what are the traits of that? You know, the first trait would be romantic. That means backward oriented, the good old times, the golden age, and so on was in the past. And the sentence theory, everything gets worse all the time, you know. Catholics have that the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas, that was the peak of the development. Since that, we have gone down into, into hell, you know. So, um, uh, so that is the uh, romantic. And, and every fascist has its own uh, past. So for Mussolini, it would be, you know, the, the Empire, Roman Empire, or the Republic. Therefore, fascist, fascist, fascist says, are the sticks with the axe in it. That's where fascism comes from, the word comes from. So it is not the roots in Jerusalem, not the roots in Athens, but it's the root in Rome. Their fascism is Roman, you know, so, so even the words, legions, or whatever, so the, you know, all the language, and also government, you know, senate, and, and all that is Roman. Um, and, and then uh, we would have, you know, the, the Spaniards would have the conquistadors, and we would have those rednecks with the big hat there, and cowboys in the southwest riding around without a sheriff, and, uh, you know, doing what the hell they want, and so on and so on, so uh, shooting one Indian after the other. So bring so, in and push. Yeah, they are, <laughs> yeah, they are some left always there, yeah. Or my aunt, you know, would say in Rochester, that were good old times when we didn't have labor unions yet in, in Rochester, and I could go on the street at 9 o'clock without being marketed, so, so that... By the labor unions. <laughs> 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 okay, so that's romantic, then it is nationalistic, right or wrong, my country. So that can be used in an relativistic sense, and, and many American politicians have used it before, but they didn't mean it, you know, so exclusively, you know, that only we or whatever, they would include the others as well, right or wrong my country, and then they add in the 60s, love it or leave it, and so that was, added. so, but if it is absolutized, then it becomes idolatry, really, you know. So if the Russians go into into uh, Afghanistan, that's a bad thing. But if we go into Afghanistan, that's a good thing. And so if the Russians had done what we did in Iraq, we would have known that it's a bad thing. But since we went into it, we think it may be a good thing. And so, so it's, it's a horrible type of a thing, you know. When I mean, it's the issue when when you come from Germany, of course, the Rhine River is nice, you know. If you come from here. The Mississippi is nice, you know, and, and as long as you don't okay. think that the Mississippi is the only damaged river there is, and there is no Volga and, and whatever, then it's normal, you know. But if that becomes really the only river, then you are nuts. Then it's, it's, it's the end of it. So nationalism, then capitalism, but not the definition, you know, the private appropriation of, of collective labor or so, but it's rather the authoritarianism that means the that there is a boss there. Without Henry Ford, you know, what would people do? They would lay at the lake there and get a suntan or whatever, you know, and, and they would be unproductive. Their life would not have any meaning and so on. So this is why, uh, why Hitler thought of Ford, the great man, you know, in economics, and he was the great man in politics, and they both loved each other. 
and they would have a solution of our, for our problem. They would close Wall Street. You know, they would cancel it. They would separate productive capital from speculative capital, which is Jewish, and they would kick it into hell. And, of course, Hitler got six million people, uh, so that's the reality. He thought seven million people back to work, you know, and, and that's when they thought he was a messiah. I mean, all that shouting and screaming and jubilation was not for nothing, you know. So, uh, and Stalin never had a depression, you know, cancelled it too. So, uh, I, we know very well what Ford and Hitler would suggest now in terms of our crisis. <laughs> okay, and then the other thing is the, is the statistic thing. The sadism, that's a sexual thing, the disorder originally, but then with us, you know, it has differentiated and have become, can become desexualized. And then, as Adorno would say, it becomes really terrible. Uh, what many prisoners in the uh, Auschwitz and Sun observed was that the, uh, um, that the SS men or the helpers who did the torturing and so on did not get any orgasm. That means they didn't get any personal satisfaction out of it. You know. Sometimes when you look at porno movies, you see there is no, no conclusion. There is no point of satisfaction. It just goes on and on, machine-like or whatever. And so the same thing you know, happened with these torturers. And according to Adorno, that made torture worse. Because if you get an orgasm, then it comes to a conclusion. But if you don't get any fulfillment, and it goes on without ending. So it makes the whole, <coughs> uh, the whole torture thing much more horrible. Um, okay, so that, uh, uh, so the sadism is directed against the, uh, against the minorities or the weak, and then the masochism. So Odysseus already was the much suffering bourgeois, and uh, also, I mean, people like Bush or what, you know, he took a lot too, you know, and he looked different when he left the White House and when he went into it, and so do all presidents, you know. So um, the, uh, the bourgeois is willing to give it out, you know, sadistically, and, uh, you know, bomb the cities to be like we did in Iraq, you know, Abu Ghraib or Guantanamo Bay, and so on. That is where the sadism breaks through, but they also are willing to take a lot, you know, in, in casualties of 5,000, uh, almost 5,000, uh, no, what is it, yeah, 5,000, 4,000, 4,000, yeah, calls the bicyclist character, yeah, right, the cyclist character, yeah, yeah. to kick downward and to bow upward, so, upwards. yeah, so <laughs> when, when Hitler said in the end, you know, uh, to the secretaries, fate wanted it that way, that means he bowed under this superpower, you know, which was above him, whatever that is. I have a whole chapter on what fate can be and what can, uh, can mean, you know, it can mean many, many ways different things. But it always has this, uh, something superior before you bow, before it down, down. And he would say, you know, National Socialism has come to its end and now take your luggage, you know, and go to the West. And, and so he was very, uh, very relaxed about the whole thing. Uh, you know, as he bowed down before this superpower which has overcome him. Um, okay, and then it can be racist, you know, but not necessarily so. So in Hitler it was very strong, and Mussolini was much weaker. In Franco it was still weaker. And you could have a fascist personality without, uh, with probably without a developed uh, uh, racist component. Okay, so just that, and then we'll have to clarify what this and it was used, you know, in, in a labor union study in the 1940s, and, and it could never be printed. Löwenthal, I think that's the one you forgot to write. Löwenthal has it in his estate. It was never allowed to be published. And then they tried the same thing again uh, with the, uh, in the border project in the 50s, which was then called Authoritarian Personality, where they worked together with other psychologists and so on. And then it was used by Fromm in Mexico City, in the suburb of Mexico City, once more in the 70s. So, uh, and, and they developed their own scale, Adorno scale, and so where they learned a lot from positivism, too. And that's good for us to, to know that, you know, what, all what you have to do in this positivistic way is not in vain, you know. So, uh, very often in America, this one doesn't think dialectically. One says, if one says, this is good, you know, one thinks the other one is bad. So... I think to be a critical theorist, one can at the same time appreciate the tremendous work which people did, you know, in, in, uh, in statistics and other uh, positivistic endeavors. They have put a lot of work into it. Yeah. Did um, 
Because John and I, we just read uh, the first chapter of Dialectic of Enlightenment, mm-hmm. and <coughs> maybe, maybe you disagree, but it seems, seemed to me like their critique of positivism and uh, instrumental reason was so strong mm-hmm. that, I mean, uh, I, I, I think, exclusive. I mean, if, if they said, I think it was uh, machine, mathematics, and organization, um, uh, the reified form of thought uh, that avenges itself on men who have um, who have forgotten it. It, it, just, it seemed so strong that right. they were yeah. almost saying, get rid of yeah. that, or that we couldn't use right. it. That, uh, but, they, you know, sometimes... Okay, but, but what you really got to remember when you get back to what you're about, he says the problem is not that science demystifies all the other things, but then in his own creation it mystifies itself. Yeah. The problem is that mystification of self and science holds so this but overarching. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't hear them say, I heard them say that the, 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 the process of enlightenment uh, mystified and the things that we are using, the numbers, the, the, uh, uh, the cutting things up was, was uh, it blind, in and of itself, it blinded us. Okay. Clarification. Um, Right. You have to understand that that was part one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's all. That's all. Yeah. yeah, part two was never written, yeah. and the closest you have is the eclipse of reason mm-hmm. with Hawkeye. Mm-hmm. And you said uh, there was some uh, a couple of years ago that there were some letters where Hawkeye mm-hmm. is talking about, right, like a skeleton mm-hmm. form of the second mm-hmm. book. Yeah, volumes of it. Yeah. Yeah. And but so if I was at Donald for a moment, I would say. You know, the truth is in the exaggeration. So they exaggerate sometimes, you know. And also, I mean, when he said, uh, you know, after Auschwitz, there is no life anymore. After Auschwitz, there can be no poetry anymore. Or a Polish guy then said, after Auschwitz, there cannot be any prayers anymore. Uh, That does not really mean that it means, you know, that art becomes very problematic after Auschwitz, particularly when you forget Auschwitz or so. So um, and it's, it's a certain uh, polarization type of a language which pushes to the extreme in order to get to the other side. Or so. It's polemics. Yeah. 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 No, I, I understand. Three, three it's four to two. Okay. We want to have the movie now. Okay. Now I have to do a few things. Um, this goes back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful Thank you. work. Now I give you the... Uh, test no, for uh, the next second test. Uh, test everybody should have one. You can have one too. I did one for you. Test number two. Yes. Yes. Test number two. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, no, we need two more. Okay. Well, if you want to, you can... Okay. How much time do we have still? Fifteen minutes. For our move. <laughs> so, have our move. so take that home and, and think about it. And we, it's not to do the next time, but maybe a week later. Two weeks. And then we can... Yeah, two weeks. And the next time we discuss things. And so pick something out which you would like me to discuss, or I go through systematically or whatever you want to. Okay? Rudy, did you get yeah. the uh, test that I emailed to you? No, I didn't get it yet. But I will okay, get it. I emailed to you um, earlier last week, so yeah, I'll send it haven't. to you again. Yeah, do that, please. Okay. I, I, I probably find it. I was gone, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. send it to you again just so, yeah. Very good. Wonderful, yeah. Okay. Then I want to give each of you a power participation screen. So don't forget this. We uh, have always a wonderful participation. So, by the way, there will be no Friday meeting. No, no scholar will come in on Friday. No, no. Friday. Little Friday. But we'll have our Thomas More thing, right? Yeah. <coughs> we will finish up Thomas More on Friday night. Everybody who wants to come is invited. And at 7 o'clock. After, right? Afterwards, we will go, yeah, we will go to the boat house and celebrate. I finally got to the point in the tutors where they execute Thomas. Oh, yeah. Terrible. That's what they will look at. Terrible thing. That's what they will look at. Yeah.
There's the little hiding. Well, that was half. Uh, that was half. That was half. You like that. I had a good I do. 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 Right. So that means Stauffenberg did his thing, Stauffenberg failed, and now they are all put into prison, including, and that is Berlin Klutzensee, including Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer in prison now. I think that's what we will see. They're arresting her yeah, yeah, there's there's a right. Right. Yeah. Did you want to say goodbye to Lenin yet? Yeah, I did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? What is the meaning of it? He was in the German no. justice ministry before. Where's that man? Does somebody have a pen? Now, maybe? Why are you arresting people? I wish I knew my... Now, you got travel papers and he's hundreds of to explain everything I can't. You must. Before they get to the 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 Well then, I 
your more recent crimes you would prefer to share with me? <laughs> well, I'd be glad to believe that uh, you're an agent for the out there, military intelligence, with special protection. Why did you withhold this information at your arrest? It's not a crime to be in the out there. Or are you hiding something? Speak up. I'm not authorized to speak about classified work. What? Nothing is classified from the Gestapo. Since when is it classified from the Gestapo? I thought. And why you? What secrets did intelligence expect the minister to secure? Uh, tell me, when did you begin your work with uh, intelligence? Late again. You think? Hmm. Huh? Yes, <laughs> quite right. You applied in 1939. You found this on your desk the afternoon you were arrested. It looks like the original. We've been wondering why you have the original and not the intelligence. They notice everything. That is, if it was sent to them at all. Yeah, a good part of it. Then I ask, are you trying to hide something? Poor part of it is in the bad shape. Hmm. And those trips we've taken aboard, those were <laughs> rare privileges. We both know that these conferences in wartime are not the bear here to be. Every country that sends an emissary expects information in return. That's why you were committed to attend. Yes? I always report it to foreign affairs on my return. That rubbish that was. I've read those before. Nothing. Hmm. Yes? Is there anything you wish to add? No. Doesn't it strike you as odd? I am not allowed the truth, and that you, Which a minute side, sit by your silence to obey this.
secular music, follows the ban of the college music, but then all the missile selection thought it was the Spanish work. Now they shot the poor communist. Yes. Put it on paper. I'll hand it round to the back. 